everybody. It's so great to see all you here. Um, so I'm just the logistical person announcing the next thing, um, so don't get too excited. Um, so we have next up a panel of three artists who are doing exactly what Jeff was talking about, who are all in their own ways through their work and through who they are in the world, um, challenging the way that we see identity, helping us see things in new ways, um, and helping create spaces where we can envision a different world um, in the future. And so they're going to have a different uh, a conversation together. Um, we have Carrie Mae Weems, David Henry Huang, and Julio Salgado. And uh, Gregory Rodriguez is going to moderate the panel. So if you guys can come up, that would be great. Um, and just as they're coming up to the, uh, the chairs, Gregory is the founder of Zocalo Public Square, which is an ideas exchange that blends events and journalism and creates a space for a younger generation that's more diverse to be able to have conversations that matter. Um, and I can't think of a better person to moderate this panel. Thank you, guys. David Sorry. Love. Sorry, coming. I'm losing my stuff. Hello, good morning. Um, is anybody as tired as I am? <laughs> is it just me? Um, I'm happy to be here uh, with these uh, amazing artists um, who have a lot more knowledge and know about art, which I don't. So I'm trying to use my ignorance today as, as to, to be a good interviewer. Um, but I want to start with the, the idea when I got this invitation from Hillary. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about, I was on this boondoggle the State Department sent me two years ago to Venice. And I just said, yes, because you're sending me to Venice to talk about American identity. And I was, you know, I thought I was fairly articulate during a, during a, a panel. And a very eager, nervous, wiry Italian man came up and said, well, um, what is it? Are you Chicano? Are you Mexican-American? Are you Latino? And I, I felt a little bit assaulted. And I said, well, it depends who I'm talking to. Well, you know, I guess I'm all, I'm all those things, but you know, who am I talking to? And are you American? I said, yeah. But we, and he said, but, but, but pick one. <laughs> and I, 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 I shouldn't have answered, but I was sort of in a corner here. I mean, I, I, he, you know, he wasn't very big, but he was wiry. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'm an asthmatic. <laughs> and we all have these identities. We've always had them. But the premise of this panel, and a lot of the premise of today, is the idea that these, these, the identity is more fluid, that we have a certain, a greater freedom to identify in multiple ways than we ever did before. In 2000, the U.S. Census um, allowed Americans to pick more than one race. Imagine that. Um, and we don't know what that means, although it demog drives demographers crazy. It's that demography numbers no longer add up to 100 in America. And then yesterday, I get off the plane looking at the news from South Carolina. I, I was sort of struck, not knowing what the significance was. But it seems to me I wanted to start sort of today's discussion off with the first woman governor of South Carolina, the child of immigrants, who both worships in a Methodist and a Sikh temple, declared essentially it time to move beyond the symbolism of a war that ended 150 years ago. That seems to suggest that this woman, the Governor Haley's identity is very complex, dealing with a more archaic, if you will, primal divide um, that we have advanced and that we haven't. And I think Jeff was referring to this complexity. And, and I want to know from the panel, first of all, is and I'm going to pick on David first because um, I interviewed you years ago in a small dungeon-like room at the Center Theater in Los Angeles. Um, and you couldn't escape either. I was the small, wiry Italian guy. <laughs> and you, were, you had just written and were presenting Yellow Face. And you were seemed at this point of your life in which you were sort of tired of identity. You, you wanted out, uh, it seems to me. And uh, I don't want to quote you directly because I'll never find it. But you were talking about this, this notion of identity having been something that comforted you at times, that belonging, that, that, that gave you a place in the world, but it was also a place that, in which you can get stuck. Are you still there at that place? And where, if not, where are you? And what do you think is happening to identity in America, racial and otherwise? 
Um, yeah, well, okay, at the time that we had that discussion, I, uh, I finished uh, Yellow Face, we were, we were about to premiere it, and, you know, it's a play in which uh, there's, one of the things that happens is there's uh, a, a white guy who, um, through a series of uh, mistakes orchestrated by a character named DHH, uh, comes to be identified <laughs> as Asian, uh, as a mixed race Asian, uh, incorrectly, and then goes on to become a uh, community role model and leader uh, in ethnic identity movements uh, until at some point uh, he, he, he's exposed. Um, so, and I think in that play, I was uh, struggling with both the joys and the limitations of um, identity politics, of ethnic identity. Um, and it had been something, because I started my career, my first place produced in, uh, whatever, 1980. So I feel like a lot of my career kind of paralleled the growth of what we now, you know, uh, uh, multiculturalism. And I felt that it was kind of a cutting edge thing to be writing about in 1980. And by the time this play premiered in whatever, 2007, I thought, you know, it's kind of, that discussion has, has happened and that w w something that was once daring has now pretty much been incorporated into mainstream thought and there are people who are for it, there are people who are against it, but it's not a new idea. Um, so I therefore felt, you know, I kind of want to get beyond that now and I was going to be more interested in internationalism um, for at least the next period of time, that is, how can some of these notions that we develop during multiculturalism be expanded outside our national borders and looked at in an international context, which I still think is an interesting idea. However, at this point in whatever we're in, 2015, I actually think America's really fascinating again. <laughs> um, and because the degree of resistance that has erupted um, over the past, um, whatever, seven or eight years, um, the degree of division and the reignition of the cultural wo culture wars is something that I didn't think was necessarily going to happen in 2007. And so what is happening at the present moment? Um, and uh, for me, it's a reaction to the demographic kind of shift where you know, a Caucasian will be a plurality, but not a majority, but and how do you define it? But anyway, uh, by, by whatever, 2040. And that there is a, uh, that the society is having a, a, a great deal of struggle to figure out what this means and, um, and white privilege and appropriation. Um, all these discussions come back in a more charged fashion even, I think, than they did in the 80s. Um, so I think this is sort of a fascinating, fascinating moment uh, for America dealing with issues of race and identity right now. And I'm working on, a, you know, plays that play, plays or plays that are kind of about these issues again, because there's a lot more territory to cover. Yeah, Thank you. Carrie, do you, uh, does that resonate, this notion of joys and limitations of identity? Does that resonate with you in any way? Oh, 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 absolutely. But you know, first I have to say that I really love, I really love this paper, this presentation that Jeff made this morning. I just thought it was, thank you yeah, so much. It was really, just really wonderful and so, so thoughtful. So, um, and, and I'm really interested in this idea. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I'm really interested in this idea, you know, of, 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 of institutions and institutes and think tanks and places where actually these sort of ideas can be sort of talked about in a uh, in a more sustained sustained way uh, through uh, through uh, across m multiple platforms because I think that it's really sort of the most interesting way of of doing it and there's something that that, that 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 David just brought up as well I mean I think that you know I can remember I can remember in the in the 1980s about 1982, something like that, uh, sitting in a, uh, an audience, um, uh, and the president of Bank of America was speaking. Um, and he said, part of his address was, by the year 2040 or something, 
um, the white majority is actually going to be the minority in this country. And I think we need to think about what that means. He was speaking at a graduation ceremony at San Francisco State. And uh, that idea really, really, really stuck with me. This idea that um, a man who represents the president of a Fortune 500 company was already deeply thinking about what it would mean for uh, the demographic shifts that would take place in the country. What would be the consequence of this? And, and so, you know, often I, 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 I uh, struggle through my days of, uh, of, uh, of who I am, living in this complex body, this complex skin, thinking about, um, about um, how to make work that um, builds a pathway through um, to my humanity. I, I'm generally not interested really in having discussions about diversity because I think that uh, uh, in, this, in this sort of format, because I think that it has been left primarily to brown people to negotiate these very complex issues. Um, and so I'm always really surprised that there are no um, dynamite white folks dealing with diversity since it is, um, a, 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 it's, it's an American issue, it's a human issue. And so there's something about, about a kind of racism, about a sustained racism that forces brown people to negotiate the struggles of white people, right? And by, by white people, I, I mean it in sort of like a, a more specific way, um, you know, that related to power and to privilege. Um, and so, if you, if we are here, if we are stuck here in this place, constantly ne negotiating the straitjacket, the box, then we actually don't really have time to deal with um, the more um, uh, dynamic aspects of life, right? Or at least that's the perception. So that we're always neg ne negotiating color, as though those are the limits to the field of our vision and to the acts of our participation. That concerns me greatly. Um, and so I do see it as being a, a limiting quality. I see it as being something that jackets us, as much as, of course, I think that it's absolutely essential to break through to these sort of human questions vis-a-vis -vis diversity. We must, because we are different. We do stand in some way as being different, but it's not, um, uh, but my skin is really not the important difference. It's been simply made to appear that way. These ideas about perception, I think, are absolutely key and, and fundamental. And so, um, so I, the, these are the kinds of questions that I'm sort of n negotiating and thinking about and spending a lot of time writing about and spending a lot of time actually making work around. Great, great. You know, the way the work is built is really trying to work around the sort of um, um, limited box of, of diversity. Julio. Constantly negotiating the straight jacket. <laughs> That's I, that. Now that goes to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what else can I say? Right, I'm, I'm like, am I? I'm, are you sure I'm the right? I should be here. You're absolutely up here. Right I'm learning. Here. Um, so, I mean, what else can I add to what you know this uh, genius have just said? Uh, but yeah, I think negotiating, um, you know, these identities in our art, it's it's been something that I I'm constantly struggling with as an undocumented uh, queer person this sort of like identities have been put on me, right? The, the documented part. And so there's this, this sort of idea that as immigrants, we, we have to show how good we are. We have to show that we deserve to be in this country and we need to be perfect. And so I think through my art, I try to uh, mess around with that idea. I, 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 I look at shows like, and I mean, I grew, in the 90s, I grew up in the 90s, I used to watch shows like Friends. And how easy it was for them to just be people, <laughs> to just you know hang out at a coffee shop and like drink lattes and like nothing, right? right? But when I make a comic strip, I have to talk about being undocumented, being queer, and what it means, you know, to to be all those things at the same thing at the same time. And so I decided to sure I'm gonna talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it in my own terms. And I'm also gonna talk about how I am not perfect, how I mess up, how you know I'm constantly making mistakes, because then it is when I do that, I sort of like let go of this idea of, of these expectations 
that, that I'm supposed to meet as an immigrant in this right. country. And so, um, I'm, I'm, you know, my mother doesn't like that. <laughs> She's like, why do you have to use curse words on whatever you do? But it, it's just, you know, something, <laughs> something that I need to do to fight those, those sort of things that are, are, put, are put on me. But at the same time, sort of like, yes, I'm queer. You know, yes, I'm undocumented, but, you know, that's not all I am. And so I think I, we're really blessed to be, art, to be able to, you know, sort of talk about that through art because we don't really have to, I don't have to write a paper about it, I just can draw about it. <laughs> so, so making fun of the categories is, is a way to, to move beyond them on some level. Mm-hmm. I agree. But neither of you mentioned, uh, uh, David had said the joy is in limitations, and you mentioned joy a little bit, but mm-hmm. is, is, is it no longer joy? Is it, something, is it something we're just working through to get to the g- greater sense of compassion for humanity? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that, that you, I, I, you, one has to uh, have joy. You know, you have to embrace the, your life, right? You embrace your life. And, you know, you, know, you embrace, the, you embrace be- beauty. I mean, you know, that, you know, that's why you get up in the morning, you know? I mean, I get up in the morning to solve these, you know, to solve my artistic problems, you know? I mean, they, they, they force me out of bed in the morning, even when I can't have hair like David's, <laughs> right, which I really want, I, we, you know, we can talk I, hair <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is, I mean, it's one of the, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, the, the f- for me, for me, really, the joy is figuring out how to really make the work, and how to make a work that is transcendent in some way, and a work that speaks beyond the limits of myself. You know, to engage something that is larger, Mm -hmm. that is deep, that is complex, that is warm, that is beautiful, that is provocative, um, and that gets to uh, something about who we are as a people, as a culture, as a country. I mean, um, that's the the joy of, of living, the joy of being able to culturally produce and then and then to be able to share that with my fellow artist and with an audience who is interested in uh, in that interaction uh, also, just let me, I, I mean I think sometimes the the artist doesn't necessarily get to pick his or her subject yeah. uh, the, the, the subject of sort of chooses the artist so I mean when I first started writing I didn't know that I was going to write about some of these things that I've ended up um, as, uh, being my, my subject matters, but I just wanted to be a playwright. And then as I started to learn to work more from my unconscious, I found that these themes started appearing on the page, you know, things that I didn't know I was interested in, you know, like immigration and clash of cultures and assimilation and stuff. So clearly some part of me was incredibly interested in these issues, uh, but, my, uh, but my conscious mind hadn't figured that out yet. And so it, right. it was as an artist, I was yes. sort of learning to kind of uh, um, harvest my my subconscious, and so you look at most artists, and they have a, a, a sort of area of interest, concern, obsession, whatever. And just to talk about playwrights, I mean, if you you could talk about Sam Shepard writing about the American West, or or Tennessee Williams writing about the American South, or whatever. There's some sort of soil from which we are nurtured, um, and that particular soil may be the result of uh, it's the result of things that we can't control some of which may be social in context because our brains have sort of been colonized by the social circumstances that we grew up in but um, you know this is just where I ended up Um, and that's that's the joy of it too the joy is that I want to explore these things I find them fascinating you 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 make it sound as if it were purely an intellectual interest Uh, presumably you were also grappling for you I, mean, you, you, I hate it when people reference the green room conversations, but I'm going to reference, um, David actually lived two, blo- lived two blocks when he was a child, a boy from my aunt, right, where she lives now. And you grew, you grew up in a place that's now about 80% Asian, but when you were there, you were one of the few. Yeah, this is the San Gabriel Valley um, in, in, near Los Angeles, uh-huh. and um, I grew up in a town called San Gabriel, which is now like way Asian, and when I go <laughs> back, all the you know, former Mexican restaurants are now Chinese restaurants. <laughs> but when I was a kid, it was mostly white and Latino. Uh-huh. Um, so, but again, I didn't necessarily know I was grappling with these issues until I discovered it through art, through, through the work. Then I realized, oh, I guess I do care about this stuff. Right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because what happens ultimately is that you know you start to 
understand again what it is that gets you out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. what your sort of concerns are and you know and, and I'm always t you know talking with young people about about you know sort of figuring out you know what what matters what they what they care about right you know paying attention to that and and, and the thing that's also I think sort of interesting to me about the the process of working the creative process is that often the work actually tells you what you're really interested in. Mm -hmm. It's not really that you've decided that this is what you, it's like, as you said, right? It sort of evolves out of the work. And so, so if you're paying attention to the work, it actually tells you where you need to go and how maybe to do that. As, 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 as you know, many musicians love to say, one of the most important things that you can do as a, as a, as a musician, as a composer, uh, as a pianist, is to get out of the way of the work. So that the work can do what it needs to do. Yes. Julio, uh, this notion of getting beyond the limits of yourself, mm -hmm. um, you, you've mentioned that a little bit. Anyway. Can we actually put up some of Julio's oh, slides okay. and go, go to them now? Um, I wonder if that, if, if it any, speak to that a little bit as you describe what we're seeing. Right. So, um, so this is an image that I made a couple of years ago um, about the narrative that we had as undocumented, Im as a child, as a, as a child of immigrants who's undocumented myself. Um, you know, this narrative that we always have to say, as I mentioned, you know, always being perfect, always sort of saying, you know, it's not my fault that I'm in this country. My parents brought me. You know, it's their fault, right? So what we were doing with that narrative was we we're blaming our parents for a situation that you know it was beyond their control. You know, but in growing, you know, in looking back, I was like, that's a really messed up narrative because we were throwing our parents under the bus. Um, it, nobody just wakes up one day and says, you know what, I'm just going to go to a different country and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> YOLO. Um, <laughs> um, no, it doesn't work like that. For, it didn't work like that for our parents. It didn't work for, uh, for, like that for any of our parents. They, they, you know, it needed, they, they took responsibility and they were like, we're going to do what, what, it, what it takes. And so it took you know, me sort of going, you know, looking at, at, that, at the positive side of that. The fact that I'm sitting here in front of y'all, you know, in New York, I took a flight to New York, uh, you know, it was because of their, you know, because of, of, of their, the, them currently telling me that, you know, we're in this situation, it's going to, we're going to work however we're going to work, you know, through it. And, and I, I found that inspiration and I, I wanted to pay homage, to, uh, you know, through my art. Um, in 2010, when a lot of folks were getting arrested to pass the DREAM Act, um, I, I wanted to take ownership of the narrative that was being put up by, by, by journalists which was, you know, this idea that, you know, how dare these immigrants are, you know, wanting to get rights. And so I, I wanted to take ownership of those images and decided to, to, you know, put it back and throw it back in the, in, you know, in somebody who's undocumented and living through this experience, putting this art in, in our own words. Um, I sort of I probably went off the question. No, uh, perfect. But, go, but, go. Uh, but yeah, so I, I just, you know, I... I I wanted to bring images because I'm a visual artist, and, and so there's so much I can say, uh, um, you know, without showing the imagery. Um, I think a lot of folks started using this word on docu queer to sort of speak to this intersectionality, right? We hear intersectionality about uh, being queer, being undocumented, and what it means, right? As somebody who's from Southern California, there's some sort of uh, privilege to being in Southern California and being undocumented and queer because there's a lot of us. Um, but then I started talking to other folks who were from the South and, you know, their experiences were much, much different. And so I think that, you know, it was important for me to check myself and be like, all right, let's let's put, you know, this other stories into into this art. David, did that, did that term intersectionality mean anything to you at all or the um. concept? The concept is great, and the word is the word is really nice. Um, the, I mean, I think what's interesting at this moment is that th we we had fairly kind of at, at a certain point in the kind of growth of multiculturalism, there's the uh, uh, the adoption of various categories and labels, and the sense that these labels were uh, were uh, fairly siloed. Um, and relatively impermeable. And I think that one of the things that has happened over the past 20, 30 years is the sense that actually all these, ca all these categories are much more fluid. And that um, certainly when we talk about um, multiracialism or we uh, talk about people who are, are, have grown up internationally or a lot of these different ideas, those are the most obvious ways in which there is fluidity between these categories, but actually, 
um, there things can can change and people can migrate and that we are you know we sort of contain multitudes as it were a and I think that idea dovetails with this notion of intersectionality that it's not you know one identity or even two or, or, or and that it can shift uh, the things that you care about can can uh, evolve over the course of a, a lifetime. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing that really interests me again about 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 some of this, and I have to, I'm just you know really taking this 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 in. You know, there are these ways. Of course, we we can talk about identity in in, in very complex ways, right? Uh, we can talk about it in relationship to to skin, to gender, uh, sexuality, preference, desire. Um, but I think that you know one of the things that's really sort of central to to um, this debate, and one of the things that has been pushed out of the category um, that I think again Jeff sort of spoke to briefly is um, is worker, is worker, is class, and that a lot of the conversation, the way that it's shaped, and the way that it's been shaped over the last. 30 years has been away from the sort of focus on class, on class struggle, on systematic organization, on systematic movement. So that we spend a great deal of time talking about these things, of course, that matter, skin. But it's not necessarily, I think, again, uh, it is important, but equally as important, I think, is our relationship to work. Um, our relationship to power, our relationship to state power. And one of the things that I saw coming out of, you know, much of the 80s movement and, 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 and much of the sort of philosophical debate that was going on from Derrida to Foucault and so forth, were really, really focused around how do we, as, a, as, 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 as nation states, as nation states really sort of solidify themselves, right? You know, and, and presume and amass extraordinary power. How does the individual, right, the social individual, respond to this alone, right? And the way in which we have responded to it, I think, a lot alone, has been around the sort of um, the, 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 the way in which the divisive issues of diversity has become huge. So that we're talking about it 30 years, 40 years, 50 years later. How do we become a more inclusive society? Right, and so I think that in some ways, as uh, of this this discussion as being not this discussion, but rather this question of diversity, is being actually a divisive, a tool against really uh, our ability to organize is, to systematically. Is it a distraction? It is, in some ways, I think, a very deep distraction. So I'm in San Francisco recently, last week. Fabulous town. I grew up in this town. <laughs> It was one of the most diverse cities I had experienced coming of age. There was a fabulous, wonderful, provocative city. You know, I went to the Vietnamese market, the Chinese market, the Latino market, the, you know, the, you know, Filipino shoe shop. I mean, you know, it was, you know, like all within like a two block radius of my house. So I'm in San Francisco last week, which has become a completely, basically, completely white town. Right, being dominated by a group of young white boys who are some of the most antisocial people imaginable who have developed social media. <laughs> right? I mean, their shit is so fucked up that, <laughs> that Apple sends out messages to their staff saying, maybe you should go outside. Maybe y'all might want to go see who your neighbors are. I mean, you know, given that, you know, you've basically taken over the community because of the wealth that we've been able to sort of bring to the city. You can no longer live in San Francisco. It's an impossibility unless you are really a millionaire. This is true. You know, so, the, so you know, West Oakland is, is, is the same way. They're giving vouchers to, you know, to, to, to black families to move to the, you know, to the, the hinterlands in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, because they still need service workers in the hotels. You know, I, mean, I mean, these are very, these are really sort of interesting, interesting questions. And so when I started thinking about this idea about otherness and diversity back in the 80s, I thought, what are we, what are we defining ourselves against? And it seemed to me, ultimately, that we were really defining ourselves against the state. 
right? We were defining ourselves against the state and the power of the state to control our lives, and we were defining ourselves in, in a way against uh, um, uh, advanced, advanced capital. And one of the things that I love about Okui and Wurzer's um, Venice Biennale, All the World's Futures, is that it specifically looks for the first time in the arts and for a long time at the sort of um, the deep question of capital and the shifting global population and the shift in these sort of shifts that are happening in the colonies. No longer are these colonies sort of, you know, outpost. They are now, they are now internal organs and functions inside of the state or inside of a city or a country, you know, in, in, in the United States, in Britain, in London, in Paris, in these sort of, um, in, their, in, in their homes. And how to deal with that, of course, is that now the question that, ne that has to be uh, negotiated. My so anyway, this is just something that I just had to say. The, 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 my first question that comes to mind is, um, if you were to be growing up in San Francisco today, what would be your concerns? Is, is gentrification uh, of cities, is it, is it destroying a, a, a deeper, richer urban and artistic life, potentially? All of you. I, well, I, I want to, uh, uh, Carrie, I really appreciate what you're saying, and I kind of wanted to kind of piggyback on it a little, uh, because I feel like, you know, there is, there is a point of view that by discussing uh, what we call diversity issues, we, uh, we uh, they therefore distract from or are a, a way not to talk about issues of class. Um, and I t tend to believe that for uh, the way that American history has evolved, um, talking about race becomes a, a sort of a proxy and um, and a way into talking about issues of class because even even in the examples that you cite when you talk about oh well they're giving you know vouchers to uh, poor black families to move into uh, uh, West Oakland the the issue of race is inherently sort of um, contained. Um, or, or class yes. is contained within race. So I feel like yes. that's how we tend to discuss it in this country. And, and I, yes, I suppose we could do it differently, but the way that the history has developed here, I think that's a, a pretty effective way. I think we can talk about race and we can talk about class through race, um, number one. And number two, in terms of the sort of nation state, I feel like, yeah, the nation state is powerful, but really, I think what's become powerful over the past 20, 30 years is the corporate state. Um, oh, yes. That the nation state seems to me to be less important now uh, than the sort of international corporate state. Yes. And that that's, uh, if we're kind of having resistance or having to figure out what negotiate, what our relationship is to power, yes. we to some extent are figuring out how to negotiate with uh, a corporate with the corporate state with uh, uh, hyper capitalism with you know this moment we're living in now and I, and I think uh, I mean you asked the question of, of, of the role of the artist you know there's while well, that this is happening there's a lot of people in this communities that are fighting back and they're they're doing you know stuff to to make sure that they're hold on to their to their area specifically like in the missionary in San Francisco um, you know, there's there's youth who are so knowledgeable about gentrification. So I'm a conversation with a 15 year old, and, you know, a uh, high schooler, and talking about how you know they're taking over other areas to create garden, community gardens. And so our job is as as artists is to how do we document this and highlight it in a bigger, you know, like make sure that people know that this is happening because a lot of the times we are seen as victims, we are seen as as people who are being displaced, but there's things that are happening in, in yes. our communities where people are fighting back. And so that I think that it's important to keep that anger because, you know, that anger sort of fuels that necessity to go and look into what our communities are doing and to highlight. And, and in my case, uh, or in our case, you know, as artists and, and you know, I, we, I, I'm part of an organization called Culture Strike, and we work with communities to, to uh, bring in um, tools for, for, for you to to, to create this in, 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 a, in a creative way, in, in, in art, we, we made a, a billboard in, 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 the mission area, in the mission area with youth who are working uh, you know, against gentrification. And so you ask them, how do you want your community to be viewed in the rest of, you know, the, rest of the country? Because you are seen as victims here. They're like, no, we're fighting back. And so I think it's the role of the artist to, to sort of highlight you know, to the, those, those actions. David, you mentioned corporate power. And 
Um, and the need, perhaps, I think you suggested, that, go ahead, Carrie, do you, oh, uh, and, and the need to, to, to resist it or to, to, to find oneself work visa against it. At the, at the same time, it seems like millennials actually worship corporate power. Is there, isn't there a sense that, 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 that Google and, and, and Apple are these incredible, powerful brands? Um, they've managed, like the, the robber barons of today have managed to pass themselves off as being cool. Yes. Um, and, and I'm wondering, it's, it's could you speak to that a little bit, Kay? It's, it's, I think it's fascinating. You, you know, I mean, I, again, I, 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 uh, uh, Julius, Julius uh, Wilson wrote uh, uh, long ago about the declining significance of race. And uh, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, th I think there is absolutely something very important. About, there is a difference between... Um, issues of diversity and issues of class, they really are not the same, the same thing. I think that they have been made to appear that way, but I don't think that they are the same thing. And, um, and there are, within, within, within um, ethnic groups, there are class divisions as well. I mean, so, so class divisions, I think, are really important to sort of look at. And, they, and, and, and what they demand from us, I think, uh, what, what they demand from, 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 from intellectuals or artists, you know, is a, 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 can be, can be a, a, a different kind of consideration. And, 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 again, one that, you know, I, again, I think about, um, a great deal. Now, this idea that that um, you know, again, you know, I was thinking about Apple the other day. You know, I mean, I bought their stock. I wish I had bought more. <laughs> I'd be like rolling. I could really, you know. But you know, and, and, and you know, I was thinking about like their first commercials. Their first commercials, like back in the eighties, mm -hmm. they were fabulous, right? You know, these sort of, you know, you know. Thousands of drones marching into an arena, you know, with this giant talking head, you know, sort of, you know, and this sort of, you know, and then, you know, this great athlete comes right, you know, running in, you know, and he sort of throws this wonderful spear and he shatters, you know, he shatters, you know, that, you know, this, 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 this sort of drone behavior, um, which was IBM. Which was IBM, and um, and now of course Apple is IBM mm -hmm. in that sort of way, uh, where we're all invested here. Uh, this idea that the individual has triumphed, I think, is really interesting. But some of their their commercials, the way in which they branded themselves, has been extraordinary, right? You know, from the, from the from from the you know the aesthetics of cool. They've really sort of figured that out, I think. You know, from the, I love opening their packages. Do you know what I mean? I mean, their whole like you know, you know, their you know their whole realms of videos is just you know just based on opening up your iPhone. <laughs> you know, not using it, just unwrapping it. You know, <laughs> so so these things. I mean, I mean, I think that they you know it's 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 really extraordinary. But you're absolutely right. You know, under the aesthetics of cool, they've been able to sort of do sort of extraordinary work. And of course, you know, I mean, Facebook, of course, you know, rose out of you know Mark's. Uh, inability to get a date, you know, therefore, you know, his rage against the female population, you know, is, is in part why we have this sort of amazing technology, you know, and now that's grown into something, something else. But I think that these sort of new, these new positions are, I think are fascinating and really have to be looked at. But can I ask just sort of one question before you sure. go? Because I'm sort of interested in um, the kind of work now that, um, that you're doing. Like, what are you actually producing? And, 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 and what, is the, what, are, what are some of the core values that are being looked at in your contemporary production as artists? Can I have artists there? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's uh, one thing I'm... Uh, we're, um, there's sort of I can talk about two plays that I'm working on. Um, one is um, a, 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 an overdue commission for Bill Rausch, so uh, who has been incredibly gracious uh, at Oregon Shakespeare Company. Um, and when, you know, when, when are you going to deliver it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bill said whenever he wants to, which is incredibly <laughs> kind. Um, anyway, um, you know my mother's family is. Uh, 
a Chinese from the Philippines. And so when I was a kid, I used to go to the Philippines uh, a lot more than, of course, I went, would go to China because you couldn't go to China then. Um, and, but I've never really written about it. So um, I'm working on a play about sort of the American colonial period in the Philippines. And um, one of the things I find fascinating is the degree to which America has been um, really, in, 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 as a colonial power, was really not good at passing along democratic values, <laughs> but really good at passing along pop culture. So, you know, it's a question like, what do we do well as Americans and what do we do, what, you know, what are we um, um, poor at? Um, so that's one show. And then I'm also working on something which is about what it means to, s to see a piece of art that is completely incorrect um, in terms of getting all the facts wrong but is really beautiful to look at. Um, and I think a lot of us have this experience when we see works that are, um, I don't know, uh, I, I, I'll just, like the current, I'll just get on this, uh, the current revival of, of The King and I, which is, I, you know, I, there's so many things that are incorrect about that show, and I always cry at the end. <laughs> and so it's a very complicated experience seeing it. Um, so I'm working on a show that's, you know, sort of where you see a, an incident that takes place in the present. Uh, that's a relatively benign uh, China-U.S. interaction. Um, and then you go 150 years into the future. And during that period, it's been iterated several different ways. So the, the, the Chinese guy wrote a, you know, told his daughter who wrote a book. The book became a musical. And they get everything wrong about the way we live today. But if we do the show right, it's also incredibly beautiful. So then what is it? And so that becomes, I guess, a play about how, how empires use culture to influence the way we see ourselves, because the, the play that we'll be seeing is sort of a Chinese production 150 years from now, and it's sort of denigrating of the U.S., and, and, uh, and I think we should get, have very complicated feelings experiencing it. So those are a couple of things I'm working on now. Nice, nice. One of the things that I'm working on then, and we actually were having this conversation back backstage. Oh. I was having this conversation with them. Um, about identity and, and, and you know this this idea of, uh, or, or this this sort of approach to creating characters who not necessarily you know we don't we don't know that experience right so so I'm working on a comic strip called Liberty for All and and this comic strip sort of you know I've been working on it for since 2010 and it sort of has evolved into um, you know collaboration of sorts with different folks um, because this this comic strip sort of touches on the on the trans you know tr you know transgender experience to the Black experience to the Latino undocumented queer experience. So all the identities are in this little comic strip. Identities that a lot of them I can't really create or write. And so the way the approach that we've taken to this comic strip is to uh, bring folks from those communities and co you know create the characters because you know I feel that I can't write those or or create those characters. Those are not my experiences. And so I feel that you know we are in a in a in a time where writers specifically white writers have taken that sort of liberty to create and speak for us and so the reason why we take that approach is because we don't want to recreate what we're what we're sort of um you know against and so i don't know i, I want to sort of like bring back that conversation that we were having backstage and, and so you know i i, I just want to explain the, the conversation they were having okay. carrie <laughs> asked david would he write a play in which she could play one of the characters go ahead and yeah, I would, but and, and, and I think I have. But Julio, I I just meant to explain oh, yeah, to the yeah, audience. Yeah. Do you, sure. you have more? No, yeah, and and I said I I said that I I could I I couldn't because you know there's there's so much talent and you know there's so many writers that don't get the credit for you know for for the work that they're doing, and so I think that if there's a platform, we should collaborate more and bring this this idea to not repeat what we're against. Carrie, you had some notions and thoughts about collaboration. Yeah, I'm just sort of, you know, wondering, you know, like at what point, like in, in your work, I understand this, I, of, of course, the notion of, of collaboration, I think it's a wonderful approach, mm -hmm. really. I was sort of really wondering, like, you know, what are the limits, what are the limits to what we are able to do now? You know, you know, and th there's been a long standing, you know, sort of debate, you know, can a, you know, can a, you know, a black female be Desdemona. You know, 
you know, you know where, where are we in, in, you know, in the ways in which we sort of envision ourselves that allow us to sort of break through um, uh, some of the divide to say, this is a human experience, and to that extent, then I should be, then, 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 then can, I, can I play a Chinese woman uh, from the 15th century? You know, can I, right, can I, can I be that, and can that, and can, and can I be that in a real way, um, for instance? You know, so, so I'm sort of curious about, about, about this, right? You know, we've been battling it for a long time in uh, the ways in which we think about um, uh, Anglo-American theater. Uh, what about um, 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 sort of, you know, ethnic theater, if I can use use that, that word? What are we at, at liberty to do? And, and do we feel limited? Do we feel constrained by our, by um, the limits of our skin? You know, by the limits of our gender? Do we feel constrained by that? Um, I think those questions are a perfect place to end. Oh, we're ending already. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to open it up. I'm getting signals here and there. Oh. To open up to the audience and think about Carrie playing Desdemona. <laughs> uh, Q and A. Any, any? Yes. Yes. Questions for the artist. Actually, hi, uh, Jeremy Liu with Policy Link, and um, I'm really fascinated by the idea of empathy and um, want to actually posit and act, get your responses to this idea that art may be serving a role to help us create empathy with ourselves. And um, the reason why is, uh, you know, we spoke, just touched briefly on gentrification, and it's, uh, there's been really factual, you know, really good studies that talk about how um, lots, of, lots of folks who would benefit from social policy for the poor, for low income, whatever, actually don't recognize themselves as that, in that category. So this whole shrinking in the middle class is partially a self-driven sort of idea, right, that there is the middle class is shrinking because we're, we're doing it to ourselves in some ways because we don't identify with what that means uh, or, or with the poor or with the rich. And so just want to get your feedback on sort of thoughts on role of empathy with, but really the way art creates empathy with ourselves. Well, I, mean, I personally started making art out of, I say, selfish reasons, but I did it because I was not going to wait for somebody to give me money <laughs> to, you know, make a book or create a comic strip. You know, I live in an era of technology. <laughs> we talked about technology. And, and so I'm like, I'm doing it because of me. I'm doing it because I, I need to tell the stories that affect me. And in turn, it has become about folks seeing themselves in, in this in this in this art that you know we're all making and that's just sort of you know the the cherry on top but but I think I mostly was thinking about myself <laughs> when I was making art I think when art works best it is it is able to, uh, do, to fulfill this dual function of expressing difference and commonality at the same moment. Yes. And so, therefore, you, as an audience member, you see the ways in which a, a character, say, of a different culture or, uh, is uh, superficially different, and the way, and you understand the humanity beneath that and empathize with that. And it's that duality that uh, potentially creates change. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautifully stated. Hi. Uh, am I on? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi. Thank you so much, and I also want to applaud the opening uh, speech. It was, it was, it's all been fascinating. I just wanted to ask the, you if you could talk a little bit about the intergenerational sort of challenges that are there. You know, I've heard conversations about what the millennials do or do not do today. I've heard a lot about intersectionality in terms of our diversity, but an area that doesn't seem to find its way into much of our vocabulary today is this intergenerational challenge. And so I'm wondering, as artists, have you seen opportunities for that in a positive way, or should all the old people just disappear? <laughs> I mean, I just, that would mean so. that we would have to leave the stage immediately. <laughs> we, we will at some point. <laughs> <laughs> we will, exactly. I mean, you know, I was uh, someplace recently with some uh, wonderful, wonderful people, and, um, you know, it's sort of like we've got to have three generations at the table. 
right? And in my studio practice, I think about having generations in my, you know, in, in my studio because, you know, because I'm, I'm excited about what young people are doing, what they're thinking, and of course, you know, the, the, the wisdom, the, the, there's nothing like the wisdom of age. You know, to keep me focused and to keep me grounded. So, uh, you know, and now I guess I'm that, right? But yeah, yeah, I think that it's a, it's it's very important, and and uh, and I'm thinking about it more and more. In fact, I'm doing a piece. It's called Swinging into Sixty, and it's a it's a it's a film that I've been working on for the last a couple of years, looking at actually this sort of question of age. And uh, you know, somebody said the other day, you know, that um, uh, women often trade on their youth and in their uh, on their in, and their beauty. And so, it, you know, if you haven't uh, uh, gathered more for yourself than that. Uh, then you're, you're in for like you know a rude awakening, uh, you know a few years down the road. That there has to be something else that's there, and that something else is uh, you know like the beauty of the wisdom that, that David articulates when when he speaks, and uh, it's it's necessary. And I challenge it, and uh, and want to be with young people and uh, hear what they are saying as well. Julio, did you have a response? To yeah, I, I think I mean I I mentioned you know mentioned words like intersectionality and I mentioned the war on docu queer uh, a couple of years ago. I was able to you know, do a billboard in in uh, in, in the Mission Air, uh, District in San Francisco, and I you know I was able to put the on docu queer images that I created, and so I wanted to be really intentional in creating messages in Spanish because there's a lot of you know, grandmas, you know, migrant grandmas living in the area. And I was like, if we cannot explain what undocu queer means to our <laughs> abuelitas, we're doing something wrong. And so I think it was, it's, it's really, you know, we, we have to be intentional in, in the sense of like, all right, we're coming up with new terms and, you know, we need to be really, really try to think about our parents and our grandmas and our tias, uh, uh, you know, who might not understand that language, both English or, you know, that social, you know, justice language that we throw around and we need to be able to break it down. And I think art does that. I think art does, you know, does that, you know, in a, in a way that our families can, can, can relate to that. Do you see yourself as, you know, see yourself as activist artist? Are you an activist, David? I mean, I see myself as an artist first, um, because actually, if the art's not doing good work, then nobody really is going to care what I say anyway. So, um, but, uh, but again, the, you know, because I discovered this, these subject matters through the work, I mean, the artist creates the work, but the work recreates the artist. So I guess that sort of made me into a bit of a, something of an activist. <laughs> a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I was able, the last year I was able to be in Stockholm with Creative Time and uh, Saskia Sassen mentioned that the need to create new language and new terms because many yeah. of the terms we use are outdated. Yeah. And uh, Carrie May, you, you kind of alluded to this, but I'm curious about how we um, uh, invent or create new frames for us to attach ourselves to. So for example, with immigration, the the protagonists are the anti-immigrants and the migrants, but we don't pay attention to the transnational companies or to the global elites. Yes, and yeah. just in terms yes. of what that means for our challenges, like climate change or ecology, and how we have to just expand our notions yes. of who humans are. Yes. So I'm curious how you all deal with um, coming up with just new uh, identities, even that we can attach ourselves to that are not so don't feel kind of mm. dated. Uh -huh. This is, I think, this is a really interesting question, and uh, again, that was something that Jeff as well brought up in his uh, presentation, and something that I think about often as well, this idea of language. How do you describe for now, for a new generation? Um, um, and, and yet, um, uh, it's so, so I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you know I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out, right? I mean, I, I have no, I have no new words. I feel like I need new words, but I have no new words, right? In, 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 in a, in a way, in a way. But, um, um, but, but my, my sort of, um, I think, I think the, the thing that I think about most is I think that, uh, that you know, that we're fearful of using language. Uh, to really sort of describe what it is that we do and what it is that we think about. 
that, that you know that I, I that this is a greater sense you know, so that so that um, that we we might be fearful I don't really care if something is outmoded and outdated as long as it describes my experience right you know as long as it describes my experience and uh, how do you keep you know that alive and it seems to me that for instance if you talk about let's say the term so socialism right communism right you know um, these terms themselves have been sort of made made vulgar ugly useless meaningless um, and at the same time we can talk about social media all day long right so so I, I mean I think that they're interesting things and of course in, in, in my in my work I'm, I'm always thinking about this but um, but I, I fail miserably at it but I know I know exactly what you're pointing to. Hi. Hi. Is this on? Yes. I'm Giselle Regatau from WNYC. Um, I have a question about um, you all as artists are addressing some of these issues we're talking about in your own work. Um, but I feel artists often end up working in isolation in a way and working in your little worlds. Um, do you have any ideas on how to transform your work and to get to what Jeff was talking about earlier, the need of creating a new consensus, a national consensus that we used to have uh, during the civil rights movement that we might need now. Like, how do we take this to an, another level? Is it through pop culture, David, as you were talking earlier? Is it through social media, Carrie, as you refer? Like, how do we, do you have any ideas of how to get there? Thank you. I mean, I kind of think that's what the, you know, to some extent, that's what this we're spending today talking about. Um, because I do think artists necessarily tend to, to often work in isolation. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, there are certain art forms that are more collaborative and, you know, theater is more collaborative, for instance. But in general, like if you're a writer, you, there's a certain amount of time you have to spend by yourself writing. <laughs> um, so th uh, um, that's just a, a prerequisite. A and it's important to be creating the work, um, but then it's, I think, also important to engage in discussion, to, um, to get together with one's peers, to have discussions you know, like this, because it, that becomes a way of engaging uh, people and uh, developing ideas uh, over and above the, just the artistic work that we do. But the artistic work, a lot of it's just going to be done alone. That's, I think, at least for me, that's how it works. Question here? Hi, uh, is this on? Uh, my name's Hua Su. I guess I'm here primarily as a journalist. And one thing that strikes me is it, it always seems as though art has helped the audience sort of imagine or bridge distance, um, whether it's just sort of the ability to imagine another. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about social media and you know, even as a journalist, when I write about super banal things and I'll get a torrent of sort of emails or tweets, things like that, I'm just wondering if the sort of age of social media or the new accessibility uh, between sort of the audience and the artist has influenced the way you've conceptualized your work. Because, I mean, we're dealing with pretty heavy-duty ideas here. And, you know, at times I imagine from the perspective of the artist it's frustrating when you're misread or misunderstood but I'm just wondering if that's something that's been sort of folded into your process or your philosophy. You should write that piece. That's a great idea. Are you going to write that piece and quote them in it? I don't, I've already forgotten my question. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Snapchat version. Anybody have an answer? I mean, I, I sort of started all the work that I do, I, I think, I think on Instagram, I think on Twitter, I think on, <laughs> on, on Facebook. Um, I remember watching, um, oh God, what's the name of that documentary? Exit to the Gift Shop. And so that came out when um, a lot of undocumented uh, students were sort of doing all this uh, mobilization and getting arrested and all that stuff. And so at the time I was like, I wanna go out into the streets and, and like post, you know, or, or weed paste, you know, on the walls, all the, the artwork that I was creating, but I was like, yeah, but I might get arrested, and you know, I might. I'll, I'll just, I'll just stick to, you know, I'll, I, I wanted to use my Facebook wall as my wall, you know, as opposed to art. And so, you know, it just became about that, about you know, creating specifically for 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 um, for social media. 
um, as uh, you know, as social media has become more popular, I, I sort of you know, and I'm a journal. I, I study journalism. I'm a, I'm a um, my background is in journalism, and so I noticed how all of a sudden the work became about oh, I'll just the journalist will just reach out to you and will reblog, and that's it. And you call that an article, and you call that a story. What I'm doing now, I'm making sure that. Journal. So um, I, I start. I made this this uh, this 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 sort of fake uh, magazines with trans people of color in the cover, and so journalists are hitting me up and they're like, "Yo, can I reblog that? Can I post that?" I'm like, "Sure, yeah, you can you can do that, but make sure you reach out to people." So you can just because you have social media, you have to do the work. You have to reach out to people. You have to call you know folks to make a story because um, I think you know the media has a lot to do with with how this works get put out there and and so i like to play with media a lot in that sense and like go do your work <laughs> okay okay so um first of all i just want to thank all of you for making space because i think it's really important that um we continue to carve out spaces for for identity to to be heard and seen um, and I'm, I'm just sort of meditating on the question over here about returning to um, a sense of communal focus on a particular issue. One of the things we talk about a lot is that, you know, it's difficult to find the sort of momentum of the 60s because everything seems so diffuse. Our problems seem, you know, immediate and diffuse at the same time. And I th I'm wondering if part of the role of the artist at this moment is to clarify that we are not in a different moment. It seems that way because we are, what we're creating, our identities, ourselves, are constantly being co-opted and commodified so quickly that we don't have a chance to reflect back. We don't have a chance to ref reflect on what we've put out there before it's taken. And so I'm just wondering if, if that might be a turn that, that artists could take, that to say, actually, instead of overcomplicating these things, we make them more simple so that people can really see that it, even as we become more nuanced and complex in our identities, the issues we're facing and the dire need of our communities is so real and so immediate. Does that make sense, that that might be a different turn? I think it's, you know, I was, I was up early this morning thinking about, um, you know, the, the, the way in which artists have operated for centuries. You know, what we do best is we speak to our historical moment. If we're vital, if, we, if we're living, if we're alive, that that's what we're responding to. And uh, I mean, I don't necessarily think that there's one thing that artists do, right? There is no one anything, right? It's all multiple, it's all complicated. But I do think that, you know, that, that artists and that arts, that art helps us see the world that much more clearly. It helps us to define it, to shape it, no, no, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, right? These issues of change and diversity are, are, are the same in some ways as perspective and color and nuance. You know, you know, you know, again, you know, I just had like the great privilege of being in Venice and I'm in this city and, you know, I'm looking at, you know, what ex extraordinary artists and architects have, have given us and the way in which they responded to, you know, notions of change, right, and how they developed churches and how they developed painting, and how the Renaissance developed perspective, and you know, how they've developed the, the Baroque and how the constructivist, you know, went on to, you know, fashion and form a, a very different way of, you know, describing, engaging, you know, uh, uh, the turn of the century, 1917, and the shifting, you know, perspective in the world, you know? And so I think artists in that way, many artists, have been, you know, very consistently responding to their historical moment, the feelings, the inspirations, the ideas, the changing same, as Amir Baraka would say so eloquently. It's simply there. It's simply there. I don't think we have to make it or force it. It's simply there. It's it's a part, I think, of the of the of the DNA DNA uh, in the culture. You know, whether it's pop culture or fine art or high art or low art. You know, um, and some of it, of course, you know, again, is you know, sort of steeped around sort of values. Right? You know, certain artists, contemporary artists, are very much interested in you know the world of abstraction and painting and color. 
right? Then there are other artists that are, you know, deeply interested in the, you know, the juncture between art and social engagement, right? And in being involved in community. Um, and to, to, you know, to, to, to such an extent, extent that now we have like, you know, um, um, art and community classes being taught in universities around the country that want to stay in the forefront of what's happening, right? That it's a whole new area of investigation because it speaks very specifically to the moment in which we live, right? Art and civic engagement as a as a as a as a as a, 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 a series of complex courses taught uh, in curriculum. I, I just want to add one thing to the, that question, which is uh, I think it helps if if we're trying to say okay this moment is not that much different than the moments in the past. I think it's important to create works about history which show actually how complex those moments were. Because when things, when you look back at history, we tend to think of it as sort of a fait accompli and that it was, you know, just sort of inevitable and it happened. Um, and, you know, I, I, th I think Selma does that to some extent. I, you know, this new musical Hamilton is, uh, is really great, I think, about um, the, the, the sort of founding of the American Republic uh, kind of period and the American Revolutionary. So I think that's one way to show that the past was not that different than the moment we're dealing with today. Uh, uh, la last question. Hi, this is mostly for David, I think. Um, you, when you talk about the, the sort of um, the cell-like quality of, you know, you're in your cell writing, it's so essential to the beginning of a process, to making a play, and yet, I'm wondering, because I'm thinking a lot about this, at what point does who you want to talk to with this work, not who do you want to talk about how you're making the work, but who you want to talk to with this work, how does that invitation get made, and where, where does that fit in the sort of spectrum of creation, as opposed to writing the play, giving it to the theater, Letting them figure out who should be invited, etc. Does it is it does it enter your process even a glimmer, like who you want to talk to, when you get something coherent? I mean, I, I think the first thing I want to do, and uh, I, I think you were saying this also, is I'm kind of creating something that seems interesting to me, because if I don't find it interesting, I can't expect anyone else to be interested in it. So that's the first priority. Um, but then second, I guess I do tend to think about, well, this is, because I work in the theater, what is, there's going to be an audience, and the audience is going to bring something to this. And sometimes it's really fun to, to utilize those audience expectations um, to, like, uh, I wrote a play called M. Butterfly that has, you know, it's sort of about a, a, has a, has a man an Asian man in basically what we now call a transgender role through most of the show. And so I assume that the audience is going to bring a certain amount of cultural baggage about Madame Butterfly and about some of Asian woman and everything, and then you can play with that. So that's, that's another degree. And then where it comes to dealing with the theaters and the audience that you engage, then that's, uh, I guess in a broader sense, a marketing issue um, and, uh, and outreach to communities. And that Something that I think I, I try to, certainly in the first productions when I'm around, uh, work with the theater and collaborate and figure out, well, exactly how can we expand the audience, because the theater wants to expand its audience, um, how can we reach uh, uh, new audiences through this work? I don't know if you meant, I don't know if that's exactly how you meant the question, but, okay. Um, and, and now I think we should all give a big thanks to Carrie, Julio, and David. Thank you all, and thank you, Gregory, also.